Our scripture reading this afternoon is from the book of James in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. James follows the book of Hebrews and comes before the letters of Peter. We'll be reading verses 1 through 18. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, Driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted... I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren, every good gift And every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Thus far in the reading of... We turn our attention now to the book of James, the portion that we have read. We have come to this portion, especially because of verse 5, in which we are told, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And when you ask anything of God, you are praying. We are in our study of the Heidelberg Confession of Faith we are, the Heidelberg Catechism, we are studying the theme of prayer. And we'll be looking at this portion because we do see in it two themes that are, that are very um, precious regarding prayer. The whole realm of communion with God through prayer. Um, in our confession, as we'll read pretty soon, it, it asks questions concerning the Lord's Prayer and how it starts. It starts by Asking why, why do we address God as as Father? Because we are going through the Lord's Prayer as Jesus taught it. Our Father in Heaven. Um, James 1 also refers to God as Father in verse 17. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. 
And when we connect these two verses together, the verse that if we lack for wisdom that we would ask of God and that every good gift comes from the Father of lights and comes from above, we, we have here, of course, a theme that every good gift that we are to yearn and desire and have, we are to go to God as our Father and ask Him for these gifts. And so this gives us an ample opportunity to talk about what, what are these gifts. And this our second point, every good and perfect gift. There's really a great realm here. There are gifts, beloved, that perhaps we need to be reminded we already have. It's not a matter of yet receiving, but even acknowledging that we have them. And when I say this, I mean even those who are not saved, they already have precious, even divine gifts from God. And the problem there before salvation is we are not even aware. We don't thank God. And it's not because we don't know. It is because we don't like Him. We, we, we suppress the truth with our ungodliness. Um, we're going to look at Romans 1 and we'll see how not a single soul is without excuse it is not so much a matter that we can't go to God. It is a matter that we don't want to go to God. That lack of desire is what makes it impossible to go unless God would then change our hearts. But the gifts are there. We're just not yearning after them. We're not acknowledging them. We're not thanking Him for them. And, and, and then we come back to prayer. When you're saved, you have prayer as a gift through which you can thank God for all the gifts you already have and ask Him for the gifts that you still need in, in order to serve Him and to honor Him and to live in a way that, that pleases Him. And so... This is a summary of why we're here, why we're in James. But let me now also read um, in Lord's Day 45 and 46. I'll read just a little portion. In page 82, um, we have question 119 that we still have yet to read. Um, at, at one point throughout these series, we'll, we'll go to the Lord's Prayer itself, um, as often we do in this series, because question 119 in Lord's Day 45 is what are the words of that prayer, the, the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. And so I'll be reading, um, in essence, the Lord's Prayer right now on page 82, question 119. The words of the prayer that Jesus taught His disciples and us to pray is, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is what I meant that through these series of questions, we'll be studying the very Lord's Prayer as we go to question 120 in Lord's Day 46, the first question is, Why hath Christ commanded us to address God thus, our Father? And the answer, that immediately, in the very beginning of our prayer, He might excite in us a childlike reverence for and a confidence in God. Think of confidence in terms of faith, which is essential in prayer. Which are the foundation of our prayer, namely that God is... Become our Father in Christ, and will much less deny us what we ask of Him in true faith. Then our parents will refuse us earthly things. And question 121, why is it here added, which art in heaven? Lest we should form any earthly conceptions of God's heavenly majesty, and that we may expect from His almighty power all things necessary for soul and body. You see here the themes of, of, of course, God is Father. And in our text, He is a Father of lights from whom all good and perfect gifts come. And then also the, the, the whole theme of prayer that if you go to question 118, what hath God commanded us to ask of Him? All things necessary for soul and body. And then question 121, in the answer that we would receive these things from His almighty power, all things necessary for soul and body. Um, and in these two 
answers, there is this thought of, of praying so that we receive things from God. But we understand from the Lord's Prayer, and we'll go through all the sequence, we're not just asking God for things. We're also acknowledging His honor and glory. There's the part of prayer, uh, of praise, excuse me. There, there's the part of gratitude in prayer. There's the part of acknowledging who God is. But there is the part of asking. When we ask God in prayer, it is not an element of selfishness in our just seeking materialism. It is our confession that we depend on Him. When we ask for our daily bread, when we ask for forgiveness, when we ask for protection from evil, and that we would not fall in temptations that assail us. And so there will be questions that deal with the asking for for the daily bread itself, but today we're looking in a general way. So going back to James in the greater context, the church was under great trial and severe trials. At the very outset, as James writes, he says, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. And this scattered abroad is not that the church was everywhere in essence. Um, it, it, it was because they had to go everywhere. And as we read through James, we find elements of this persecution. They, they were scattered because they were in exile. Um, it's not that they just decided to travel and, and, and there were church plants in different places. It's not that they sat down and said, we need to evangelize the world. Let's effectively go in different places. No, they, they, were, they were hiding. They were in pilgrimage. They were um, losing homes and losing loved ones. Some were losing their possessions. They were some in prison and some in pilgrimage. They were hurting Physically, and if they weren't, they were hurting emotionally. Many were hurting in both ways. Some were hiding and some were fleeing. And so this is why they were scattered. They were experiencing fear, very likely hunger, cold, solitude, confusion. Um, having to learn how to deal with anger, self-pity, um, envy, pride, covetousness, even hatred. It's very tempting to hate the people who are hating you and who are stealing your home and your goods and who, who killed your loved ones. When you're having to focus greatly upon trying to live, it is very difficult to focus upon the needs of others so you can easily become selfish and self-protecting. Um, when, when you are struggling to make ends meet, you don't have usually the time for meeting the needs of others. Temptations there. So persecution was the trial in, in the whole um, passage here. I remember almost two years ago we were in this passage and I dealt um, in, in depth in, that there are two words here for temptations. The first word for temptation could really be translated also trials. And they, they refer to the afflictions themselves and the persecution. And then later, James gravitates to another word that can be translated temptation that are more regarding the reality of being tempted to sin. And so persecution was a trial, but then selfishness would be the temptation. Um, another example, affliction that they had was a trial and, and the hatred that they could experience was the temptation. The loss of land was the trial. Covetousness and self-pity was the temptation. The persecution and the affliction is certainly under the sovereignty of God and, and God can use means by which they come. You think of Job, how, how it was Satan who brought those afflictions to Job but they were all under the sovereignty of God. But then we find that passage that very clearly shows that no one, none of us, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Even though the temptations that we would wrestle with, yes, they're also under the sovereignty of God, but see, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. He can bring trials but He never causes you in a seductive way to see if you fall or don't. 
That's what Satan does. See, every man, when he is tempted, he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So yes, God can bring in affliction. But when you and I are tempted to sin, that originates in our own hearts. It is because of our own weakness. So, so there's this distinction being made right at the very onset, uh, outset. And, and I could read a little portion where one commentary, when George Stulak, he gave a little summary of James. He said this, Your trial is not the time to rejoice less. Your sickness is not the time to pray less. Your loss is not the time to love others less. Rather, now is the very time to practice the joy, the peace, and love that we know theoretically to be the Christian life. For the Christian life is not mere theory. It is the life of the servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Think how true this is. We, sermon after sermon is about these virtues and these realities that if you and I were to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we have to have this, this godly character. And when will that be put to the test more than during a trial and during an affliction? And that is really what will show who we really are. And so we, we, we make this distinction of, of the two words for temptation. They are different in the Greek. One is perazmos, this, that is the word for trial. And there is perazo, which is the word for temptation, as in being tempted to sin. Um, and the blessed pattern of the first is this. A trial may be used of God to bring forth perseverance in your life. This is why he says that we should count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations because a trying of your faith worketh patience. Patience has her perfect work that she may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. That, that is like a, a growth in, 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 in wisdom and a growth in maturity. You're becoming more and more like Jesus. And what God is using is the affliction that you're going under, that you're under. But then the sinful pattern would be here's a temptation in terms of a seduction. And then what can happen if we fall is we sin. And if we stay in that sin, it breeds forth death. In the same way that he speaks of trials and, and leads to continu continuity and leads to maturity, he does the same thing with, with the word temptations that mean like tempted to sin. That's why he says in verse 14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And you see the contrast of each. The trials can lead you to Christian maturity. The temptations in which you would fall can lead you to death. And, and, and in this world, we are under all of this. The very, the very trial that God may put you under, Satan will use that and tempt you. And, and, and this is, again, the context, see, that, that we're under here. These were people who were being persecuted. It would be very easy for them to look at Christians who weren't being persecuted and be, and be um, envious of them. Or they could think, well, poor me, and be self-pity, full of self-pity. Or they could look at the goods they have lost and, and just cry over those lost treasures and not realize that they still have Jesus and, and their struggle could be covetousness or greed. And so the trials that God brings, Satan can use that with temptations. But see, if we are tempted, it's not God that's tempting. The origin is our own hearts. We're the ones desiring to sin. So this is the great um, context of this whole passage. And we will start with our theme of prayer in our first point. Prayer and communion with God. Looking at verse 5, and, and, and we find here James saying very clearly, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. See, in our human reason, as we read the verses prior to this, are familiar to us, I'll read them in just a little bit, we can never really, in human logic, agree. Again, what do, what do we read? My brethren, count it all joy, verse 2, when you fall into diverse temptations. It's not have joy when there's one trial. 
It is have joy when there is diverse trials. Trials of every kind. Trials regarding loss of possessions and loss of loved ones. Loss of freedom. Trials because your health is in danger. Trials because there are afflictions among people. See, these are all trials. And and James is saying, count it all joy. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. See, we're, we're not to have joy because of the trial, but because of what it can produce. That trial may bring forth in you a a perseverance. That's the word patience. And then that perseverance will grow. And when it says have her perfect work, that means that 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 perseverance is growing and it's doing something in you. And he says that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's, That's the expression for maturity. It's not the sense of sinlessness. That'll never happen until Jesus comes. But see, that is a direction we're going and and, and we are living in days looking to that day that we will be like Jesus, perfect and with no sin whatsoever. And God is growing us in that direction, even though it will never happen that we reach that plateau of sinlessness. We are growing where we are supposed to sin less day by day and that we are to be more like Jesus day by day. And what God is using for that to happen are the trials. And so we look at this and as we understand, we think, okay, I can understand it, but how can I count it all joy? How in my experience I can be full of joy with all these persecutions? I'm still weeping because of my loved one who was taken. And so and so is in prison. And we can no longer join together in worship because our, our churches are being closed. How can I count it all joy? And and you can easily understand why any of us, or most of us, or even every one of us, would lack wisdom. See, James introduces this here because this is precisely what we need to to count it all joy. When we are suffering under diverse temptations, the only way to do that is if we have wisdom from above. And he introduces this right here, which is a theme of prayer. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. And the word liberally means he he will give it um, promptly. It's not just a sense that he will give it as much as you need. It is more in the sense that he'll give it as soon as you ask. He will give it promptly. He won't he won't go on and on and on without giving it. He will give it. Liberally, He will give it as soon as you ask. And isn't this encouraging to see? We, we read a portion that in our hearts we're there thinking, how can I do this? And the very next verse says, this is how you can do this. And it shows also that the reason it is hard for me to understand to have joy when my house is burning or when my friends are in prison, the reason I can't have joy is because I don't have wisdom. See, God's word is teaching us where we lack. He he could have said, of course, there are many things here. It it could be a a lack of of self-control. If if it is that my my patience is running short and I'm I'm angry at those policemen, or it, it would be patience and it would be lack of love for them. They have souls. They need Christ. I shouldn't be angry at them and 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 call out names at them. I I need to bring them to Jesus and present them Christ. But my, my struggle will be hatred. So he could have said, if any of you lack love, let him ask. If any of you lack self-control. But why did he choose wisdom? Because wisdom is what will help you even have a mind to understand that this whole realm, that when there are afflictions, we need to rise above the afflictions. And we need, in essence, to do what the text is doing, be, as it were, alongside the Lord himself who reveals this to us and shows what's happening in this realm, in this world. Yes, there are afflictions. And we're losing many things. But we have God who reveals all of this to us and he gives us exactly what we need. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. And he adds this, and abradeth not. 
And he doesn't rebuke you for asking too much. He doesn't rebuke you for not using what he's given you. Let's say this happens. You ask for wisdom. He gives you an element of wisdom. And for a week, you can look at your afflictions with a peace in your heart. And you even have this joy of the Spirit. And you're rejoicing. But all of a sudden, you hear the news of another loved one who is put behind bars. And you find yourself again thinking, Lord, now what? Now still joy and now still contentment. Lord, how can I do this? And you, and you think and, and you start maybe complaining and you start now having self-pity and you start having hatred. And then you even think, how can I go back to God for more wisdom? Well, the text is saying, go. The fact you're sinning and the fact that you, you have disdain in essence, the wisdom he gave you and only lasted a week, that doesn't mean there's no more for you. He abradeth not. He will not rebuke you and say, I gave you wisdom last week. You want wisdom again? And Calvin says this thing about this that, 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 really, that, that really resonates. I, I, re, hear what I will read and you will see what I mean. He says, those who are the most liberal among men, when anyone asks often to be helped, mention their former acts of kindness and thus excuse themselves for the future. Hence a mortal man, however open-handed he may be, we are ashamed to weary by asking too often. Isn't that how we are? Um, um, If you have um, had a need for money and you go to a friend and you say, look, I'm really needing some money right now and I would never do this if it weren't so urgent. Let's say he helps you. You deal with your issues next week you need more. How easy is it to go to that same friend? Maybe if it's your father and your mother, it is a lot easier. We should treat our children in a way where they will think like this of us, like we are to think of God. Never, dear child of God, think that God will look at you and say, What did you do with the bread of last week? What did you do with the love I gave you already? What did you do with the wisdom? Has has it exhausted and you want more? See, that would be abrading. That would be rebuking, reproving. James is saying God will not do this. And, And this is how Calvin ends. But James reminds us that there is nothing like this in God. For he is ready ever to add new blessings to former ones without any end or limitation. Isn't that encouraging? That this is, beloved, what prayer is. And and. What is it in prayer that we do again and again and again? And God never says, I've done that already, now there's no more. If I I can think of the Lord's Prayer, of course, there's all the praise, and then there's elements of gratitude, acknowledging of God's kingdom, but then we ask for bread, and we ask for forgiveness, and we ask for protection from temptations and the evil one. We don't feel ashamed to ask for bread because obviously we finished one meal, we we need another. There's something realistic there. It's not that we lost our meal and we're asking God for another because we, we weren't careful about where we put it. And then when we think of the danger from evil, Satan is always assailing, temptations always surround us, our, our, our hearts have this battle against sin. There's even a realistic element there in the spiritual realm. But look at this middle petition. Give us our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Beloved, how many debts, how many sins has God <clears throat> had to forgive you. And there are times, maybe you've experienced this, that you felt, maybe I I can't come so soon because he will abrade me. He will reprove me. How can I come again? It is the same sin. So many times I have grieved him 
I have hurt loved ones. But the Lord's prayer is ever a prayer for you and me to keep praying, to keep asking. If you lack wisdom, and if you lack holiness, if you, ask, if you lack love, if you lack patience, if you lack contentment, let him ask of God that giveth to all liberally and abradeth not. He will never rebuke you for coming for the thousandth time asking for that gift. And it shall be given him. But then here's the key. Verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Now, this is how you're to see it. If you do think, well, maybe God will abrade me, that is already lack of faith. So he commands you, uh, he, he tells you that God will not upbraid you. He will not rebuke you. And then he says how important it is to have faith, which, which if you don't, one of the ways that you would expose that is by wondering if God would rebuke you. And you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to wonder if he'll rebuke you because he won't. He wants to give you what you lack. And when you come to Him, even though you don't have it anymore because you despised it or didn't use it wisely or, or fell again and sinned and, and you're not sensing that wisdom so you're not finding the joy and, and you're not growing in patience and that trial is now more like a temptation seducing you to sin and you feel selfishness, you feel self-pity and then you're so much in that muck and God is saying, come to me and I will give you what you need. Pray and ask, ask of God. Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, promptly, earnestly. And he, of course, will give all that you need. And so this is our first point, prayer and communion with God. But as we move through the text, we, we have this theme now, secondly, every good and perfect gift. And in verse um, 17, after he speaks of where temptations to sin come from, and, and it is from our own sin, every man that is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust, verse 14, that's the origin of temptations to sin. Even if Satan is the one who's tempting or the world, the only reason we fall is because our hearts want to fall. This is very important, beloved, because many people suffer because they are pointing fingers in the wrong direction. Um, the key mistake of Freudianism is the theme that you are a product of what others have made you to be. And that is utterly false. Freudianism points fingers at everybody else. And when you do that, it's just one more sin you're committing. When the solution to understanding the origin of sin is, is in our own hearts. I am my own enemy. And even if Satan tempted and the world is there and tempting, the only reason I fall prey is because I chose to do it. Beloved, that, that's a key element to understanding our sin and dealing with it a biblical way is stop pointing fingers other than to yourself. That's the only thing that will bring true repentance and true cleansing and even a working in a way that will mortify sin so that you live now in holiness. And so after he deals with where all of that comes from, which is our own hearts, in verse 17, he'll speak about where all the good gifts come from, where, where everything good and everything perfect. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Um, some commentators believe this is here, variableness and, and, and shadow of turning, because if you go back to the reality of, of affliction and persecution and we're all running for our lives, the temptation is to think, what has God done? Has He changed? 
He was a God of love, but what is he doing now? He seemed to care for me, but now does he? And, and we need to understand, no, there's no change in God. The change in my condition does not mean a change in God's heart. There is, there's not a, even a shadow of turning in him. We, we need to also be careful. This is another element that is very sad. Not only do we tend to blame others, but then we also start thinking evil of God. And we're, in essence, blaming God. But, but he already dealt with this. God, God is not bringing that to make you sin. That affliction does not mean he doesn't love you. That affliction is under his sovereign care. And you need to trust that there's nothing changing in him. He's still a God of lights. And the, the, the phrase God of lights is bringing the sense of, of his splendor and of his majesty. Think of God of heaven. And heaven is a kingdom of light where there is no sun there. No need for sun and stars because God is the light in heaven itself. So that he is the father of lights. And from him flow every good gift and every perfect gift. See, it comes from above. It comes from heaven. Let's talk for a moment about these gifts. Well, I want to start about the gifts that he's already given everyone. Whether you are a believer or not, one gift that God has given you that has come from the Father of lights, that has come from above, is the gift of life existence into this world that he has created. And in this world, he has given food, he has given rest, he has given clothing, which grants the ability to stay alive and enjoy his creation. You, you see that all of us living in this world live because of the gift of life, and God has encircled us with things that keep us alive that keep us alive. Um, it is astonishing to think that we are still drilling the ground after what we believe to be six to seven to eight thousand, ten thousand years that the world has existed, and there's still oil, there's still gas, there's still aluminum, there's still magnesium. You need to put lime in the fields, you go to the grounds and you find it. You need potassium for the plants, you go to the grounds and you find it. We need iron. We go to the ground and we find, we don't plant iron. We don't produce iron. It's in the ground. Now remember when, when my wife and I, Barry and I moved to the north um, of Brazil where she was raised and she was very acquainted with, with the forests and the woods of the Amazon basin, but it was astonishing for me to go and to see places where you still saw trees that were not like the sequoias of California, but they are in essence the sequoias of Brazil, 800, 900 years maybe, um, not too many, but some that are still there. And then there was one tree that was already fallen, and my father-in-law sold that tree, and it was something like, in the price of wood, $8,000. And I thought, this was a log on the ground. We don't know who planted, nobody planted that. That was probably a, a 400-year-old tree. No one planted it, but it was there to, to serve us. It was the love of God for us to be alive, to provide what we needed. That's a gift God gave. Do we acknowledge this gift? But not only that, everyone living has another gift whether they know it or not, whether they like it or not, it is the gift of his image and likeness. Every single human. That is, in essence, what, what makes life full of dignity and value. These two things, that God gave it, and that as he gave it, he gave his image, his imprint, his likeness upon it. And part of this element of, of having the image of God is having an element of knowledge, and, and I want to point you to Romans 1. Romans 1 is the passage that mainly speaks of this reality in a very, in a very certain way. It's, it's not like a possibly people know certain things. Possibly there is an element of knowledge. No, every single human knows. Where does this knowledge come from? It comes from the image of God in man. 
Now, of course, this knowledge is impaired. This knowledge is obfuscated. It is, it is erased by the sin of man, but it's still there, marked. No one can get rid of it completely. Try as you may, but see, this is, this is the sin of man. They have suppressed the truth. But see, they know they're suppressing the truth. And that is the knowledge. And let me start reading in Romans 1, in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. See, it starts there that men, even in their ungodliness and unrighteousness, it is not out of utter darkness in their minds. They are with an agenda. They are holding, this is the word, suppressing the truth. See, they know the truth is there. Only they suppress it. And yes, by doing that, it does have an effect in their consciences where they are driven further and further away from it. But it's still there. If you sit with someone and it is very quiet and they have no more of their friends to speak things in their ears and you are long enough with this person, maybe you will hear them whisper, yes, I know there is God. And see, don't be fooled. If they don't whisper that, it doesn't mean they don't know. Our certainty is Scripture, which never fails. Look at verse 19. Because that which may be known, see, there's the knowledge. Where does that come from? From the image of God in man. Every man and woman knows, see, that which may be known of God, and notice this, is manifest in them, not to them, not on a blackboard for them. It is in them. See, the little word in is very important. It, it is in the very heart. For God hath shown it unto them. See, there's even the divine hand having revealed it unto them. And then verse 20, for the invisible things of him, even invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly Seen. That's why Cain, even though he despised God, he knew there was God and spoke to God. Being understood, see there's the knowledge again. Where did this understanding come from? The image of God. Being understood by the things that are made. And what are the things they understand? There's, there's a summary. Even his eternal power and Godhead. Godhead is the reality that God is. They know there is a God and they know He is powerful. At the end of the day, they understand there's no such thing as a big band. They understand down deep that is utter foolishness. There are those who are brave enough nowadays to even declare that. They know He's powerful. They know he's God so that they are without excuse. See, the only way you and any human could be without excuse is if they know something. In verse 21, because that when they knew God, you see how he persists with knowledge. And here's the problem. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. And when it says it was dark, and it doesn't mean they stopped knowing. It just becomes a very faint knowledge. And the deeper someone goes in sin, the more darkness really overpowers them. But you can never erase the image of God. So that knowledge will always be there. So that's very critical because as you evangelize someone, don't ever feel... A word that you say is in vain. Even if they say, stop talking, whatever you were able to speak of the gospel, that can be imprinted in their hearts. The Holy Spirit can use it one day to convert them. And they have a witness in their own hearts to know that that is true. The problem is they don't want to know. And so these are the gifts God has given. Life 
and his image and his likeness. And then we could even go further and speak of gifts and talents. Even unbelievers have talents that are astonishing. Think of the composers of, of music in the ages, doctors, inventors, professors, many of whom have contributed greatly to the good of humanity in many times in the past and even in the present. How many of us may owe your very life to a surgeon who operated very skillfully and you're here alive? This is God's gift in their lives, and it reverberates into ours. So these are gifts we really should acknowledge and thank the Lord for. See, we, we even read in Romans, the, the problem is these are gifts they have, but they're not thanking God. This is the great thing of being a, a believer. You can thank God for those things. But then let me just end by talking about the gifts that God gives us if we ask him. Because this is, this is where the text is speaking of every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. This involves then everything we've been talking about, life and the image of God and having these talents. But because he's speaking of wisdom, something we don't have and we need, let's speak now of these gifts. The ultimate gift I want to start with is really... a. Alluded to in verse 18, not just alluded, but he goes right to it. Look at verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, being begotten of the Father in the spiritual sense is the ultimate gift. And you see what, what he's, he's saying. If this is a gift that comes from above, and if you lack it, he's saying for you to ask for it, for, for you to have this gift, you need to ask that he would give you the new birth. This is the ultimate gift. Because you'll never see your need for wisdom. You'll never have faith with which you must ask for wisdom unless you are born again. That's what you need the most. To be begotten of the Father with the word. They have life and they have the image of God. But if they're not with a new birth, they're not alive spiritually. They're not saved. This is the blessed, the greatest gift of all because it's the gift of Christ in your life. Christ, of course, is the unspeakable gift. When you are born um, begotten of the Father, that means that Christ has saved you. He's the grandest gift because only through Him you can be born again. He's the grandest gift because only through Him your sins are atoned for. That's what it means to be born again. Only through Jesus you are forgiven and cleansed and made new. You are made then a child of God and the Spirit is in you all through the Lord Jesus. Now, why is the theme of gifts so important? Why does James speak of, of every good gift and every perfect gift? Um, one commentator alluded to this, and, and I do believe this is the key here. What was the context? How, how we began is, is how we end. The context was of severe and great persecution. These people had lost many things. Boys and girls... Think of little children who may have to have left their homes. Maybe they had just had their birthday the day before and they had many gifts. But now they were um, running and fleeing for their lives and their gifts are gone. They lost them. Maybe wives have lost husbands and parents have lost children. They have lost family or friends or farms or lands homes, the, the fruit of their trees. Maybe their barns were full of the harvest and now it's all gone. See, they had many gifts that had gone away. And God is making them realize that as much as they have lost much, they still have more. They have God. They have the very Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. If you are born again, beloved, no matter what persecution comes upon you, it's connected so much with the sermon this morning. 
maybe in becoming a Christian, and in many lands, this is so much what happens. You become a Christian, and you might lose father and mother and children and, and family and if you become persecuted by your own family. And, and if all these things happen, and Jesus there said, if you lose these things for Christ's sake, you'll receive more in this life and eternal life to come. See, this is the reality of the believer. No matter how much you lose when you, when you serve Christ, you're still rich and you have more. And this is what God is wanting us to understand, not just them. Beloved, we can be thankful we're not suffering these things, but each and every one of us have suffered many things. You may have suffered great loss. And, and this happens even without persecution. It can be health related. It can be loved ones related. And we think of the families grieving in Grand Rapids, and it is because of a loss. And the Lord wants us to understand that even though there may be losses in this world, when you serve the Lord God, you always have more than what you lose. So that you'll always understand it is worthwhile to serve the Lord. You have God himself. Remember when God came to Abraham after he fought that war and God said, I am your exceedingly great reward. I am your shield. He says, I am your exceedingly great reward. Not that I'll give you many things. I am your great reward. When you have the Father, you, it's because you have Christ and you have the Holy Spirit. You have the triune God. And then who you are. See, he says that you should be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. You are his child. You are of his people, the body of Christ. You are of the Lord Jesus, the Son of God. And so when we go back to the Lord's Prayer, you start, Our Father who art in heaven. See, you're, you're supposed to think this way. God is my Father. I am his child who art in heaven. That is the Father's home. That is my home. And all these glories and wonders that I praise Him for and the things that I need Him for, I, I'm to acknowledge that no matter what happens in this earth, however many subtractions there are, there are always more pluses and more rewards and more blessings and more gifts so that I should never feel sorry for myself. I should never envy others. I should never be selfish. I should always think, okay, I'm suffering, trying to live, but you're suffering too. Here, I have enough. Let me help you, or let me at least pray with you. We never need to fend just for ourselves, because we're fended for. Because the Father of lights is our Father, if you are saved. And, and I want to challenge you, beloved one who is not yet saved. See, you still need to be saved to thank God properly for the life he has given and for the image of God that he has imprinted upon you. And then the gifts and the talents that you have. You may be an amazing engineer. You may be a wonderful father or a mother or a little child who is studying and doing well in school. Those are the gifts God has given you and you need to thank him. And you thank him first and foremost by saying, Lord Jesus, save my soul. Do like the beggar this morning. O oh, son of David, have mercy on me. Be like the publican. God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And when you are saved, you will thank him. And you will pray. And you will see him as father. And you will honor him as a father of heaven, lest we would see him in a familiar way where we don't honor him and exalt him as the catechism teaches. And in all of this, I, I just add this word. No matter what affliction and no matter what persecution you and I might suffer, the Lord Jesus has suffered most. And he's been there before. He is the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So that in whatever sorrow we may be in, we're never alone. He is with us. And he knows what you're going through. He knows it's hard. Because he suffered more than that. 
for his own. So count it all joy when you suffer diverse temptations and knowing that God will use that to try to test your faith, to grow it, that you would mature and be more like Jesus. And we study, as we study the theme of prayer, let us then, then pray. Let us pray more and earnestly and acknowledging God as our Father, trusting He won't rebuke us for asking the same things again and again even if you're asking for salvation because you need it. You and I cannot live without being saved. It is the greatest thing you need. And once you have it, to have Christ will always be the greatest gift. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious, glorious God, we thank Thee, Lord, for every good gift and every perfect gift. We acknowledge, Lord, that they come from above, from Thee, the Father of lights, the Father of heaven. Lord, help us to believe that as we ask for things again and again, that never we will be rebuked for asking. But Lord, help us to be encouraged to do so. Help us to be sincere in doing so. When we ask for wisdom, Lord, we, we pray that Thou would give us the faith that we need so that we would not ask wavering and being like the man who is tossed to and fro by the waves. Help us, Lord, to be stable. We pray that faith would make us stable. Help us, Lord, to have stated times of prayer that we would pray for wisdom. If we see that we're not full of joy or even with a little joy, oh Lord, help us to ask for wisdom. Help us not to rest until we have it and that we would ask for everything else, all the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, how we long for joy and contentment and grace and holiness and gratitude and thankfulness. We pray, Lord, that Thou would work these graces in us. Self-control, kindness and gentleness, meekness, humility. Lord, who of us would say we lack no more of one or the other? And we pray, Lord, that we would trust that there is no rebuke, but that the rebuke would be that we don't ask as much as we should. We pray that Thou would save those who are lost, Lord, that they may begin thanking Thee for the gift of life and the gift of, of the image of God in us and the gift of new life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be singing Psalter 253. I'm following this second offering. We'll sing stanza 1. 6 through 7, then 11 through 12.